Well, good morning to those of you in the room, those of you watching online. We're uh, changing things up today. So we're starting with teaching. And some of you are like, oh, no, what's going on? This is just weird. Um, and some of you are first-time guests, like, I don't know any different. But maybe you've had some experience with church services, and you go to a church service, and there's, there's all this music up front, and you're like, that's kind of weird, too. Why do, why do we even do that? And could I ask one of you to grab my podium for me? Uh, we, why, why do we do that? And so uh, just going to jump in. A couple of things. If you uh, have already picked up a teaching outline, that's great. I hope that it will help you. Some of you have already made comments to me. Oh, good grief. It's double-sided this week. That must mean you're going 75 minutes. And so I promise you, if you would notice, please, the title, Gages, Gifts, and Playing Games, Part 1. This outline will serve you well over the next two weeks. I promise you we're not covering everything uh, on the outline. And so just rest easy. Uh, we're just not going to going to do that. And so we're in this, this series uh, just called uh, Overflow to Go, based on this verse out of Romans chapter 15. It's a prayer, actually, where this pastor writing to this church in Rome, and he prays, he says, and now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we kicked this series off last week, and if you want to catch up, you can go to our YouTube channel, just go to YouTube, uh, search Miami Valley Church, and it'll pop up, and uh, you can watch it there just to catch up. But we're, we're just talking about what, what do we do with this, with this uh, overflow? When, when God just, we trust him and we trust him and we trust him. And, and life on earth is really about learning to trust God. And every time we trust him, he pours into us joy. He pours into us peace. He pours into us joy. He pours into us peace. And then when we reach a stage, hit something, I don't know how I'm going to handle it. All of a sudden, joy just, I mean, just hope just comes flooding out. And you just want to know uh, how in the world uh, can I overflow with joy. And when I read the gospel stories and I see the life of Jesus and I watch him interact with hopeless people, I watch them walk away ready to go. Because the overflow he gives us through the power of the Spirit that, that as God comes to meet a need in our life, as he fills us with joy and peace, uh, the Spirit comes into our life not to enable us to sit, but to empower us to go. He just empowers us to go away from what he's done in our life uh, uh, differently. And so you watch, and as Jesus looks at people that are hopeless and hurting, as he, as he sees them, he knows what they need, and he, he begins to pour joy and peace, and they, and they walk away with hope. So if you brought a Bible, you have a mobile device, I, I just want to take you to a story in the Scriptures about a lady. It's a lady who has been ill for 18 years. And, and it's not just that she's been ill for 18 years. The Scripture says to us that she's doubled over. And so this is how she goes through life. She's doubled over. It's that she cannot straighten up. And it's annoying to look at somebody who's doubled over, right? Especially when they're trying to talk to you. And, but, but that's all they can see. And what you know when you're doubled over is although you can't see them, everybody notices. Everybody notices what's going on with you. And she shows up one day in a church service, doubled over for 18 years. And Jesus sees her. Luke chapter 13 Luke chapter 13, and this lady only gets three verses in the scriptures. Three verses. And her story has captivated my attention for about the last eight months. And so if you have a Bible or a mobile device with you, Luke chapter 13, I'm going to start in verse 10 and read through verse 13. And so out of reverence for the word of God, I'd invite you to stand if you're able this morning as we read from Luke chapter 13, verses 10, 11, 12. And 13. This is the word of God for the people of God. On a Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your eternity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up. And praise God. God, would you just help us to see in those places in life uh, where we're doubled over. Where the only thing we can see is what's beneath us and not what is above us. God, I pray that today we would hear your word, we would feel your touch, and that we would leave praising you for who you are. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanks, and you can, you can be seated. I read this story of this woman. We don't even know her name. She gets three verses in the scripture. Uh, why, what's the purpose? One woman, one Sabbath, one synagogue, one healing. So what? Why even include this? 
Uh, this is the only gospel. Luke's gospel is the only gospel that includes this story. It, it seems so insignificant and it seems so ineffective. And, and I've been wrestling with this passage of scripture for the last about eight months and I'm wondering why here, why here, why here? And part of my confusion in, in wrestling with this scripture was uh, the way my Bible divides up the chapter. Uh, in your Bible, there are uh, every book has chapters and verses. Those weren't originally uh, in the original documents, but uh, not just chapters and verses, but people way smarter than I am. Please hear me say, people way smarter than I am uh, break up the passages of Scripture, and there's a, there's a break, and then there's usually a heading. And I think there's an inappropriate break in the Scripture because after, after he heals uh, this woman, uh, Jesus goes on to talk, and, and this is what Jesus said after he heals this woman. Uh, what is the kingdom of God like? To what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. And again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into, the, into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked its way all through the dough. I think what Jesus wants us to see in this one healing of this one woman in this one synagogue on this one Sabbath is that if one person will let God heal them, if one person will truly be impacted by the word and the touch and the healing of Jesus, it's going to spread like wildfire. It's really going uh, to take, it's going to be like a seed that goes into the ground and it produces a whole tree. It's going to be like a little yeast that goes into a, a 60 pounds of flour and it leavens the whole loaf. Just one person, just one person, just one person. And I, and I want to ask you would, you, would you, would you pray with me that just one person today just one person, and maybe it's you, would, would just be impacted by this God who, if, you, if you'll just trust him today, he'll pour uh, hope, all joy and all hope inside of you, and, and that you're just going to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, when something comes up. I, I want to just look at this story, and I want to look where we left off last week about how do I, how do I praise God, and how do, I, how do I move forward? How do I know if I've got hope that's just going to come flooding out of me? And, and so I, I uh, had somebody... Uh, get me this week a whole bunch of gauges. Uh, do you know gauges? Uh, gauges, uh, it's one of those interesting eagle, e e English words. It can be uh, a noun and a verb. By the way, if you want to find a, a definition of a gauge, do not Google gauges because it will show up with those things that go in your ears. Uh, if you want to understand the definition of this, uh, make, it, make sure it is singular. All right, gauge. Uh, a gauge is an, uh, an instrument or device uh, that's used to measure, it's used to measure magnitude, um, content, or volume, and it usually includes a visual display of such, so you can know how much is, how much is uh, in there, right, a gauge, and so you have gauges on everything, and those of you who know how to read them, they provide great help to you, those of us who don't know how to read them, like, that's neat that there's a gauge here, but I don't know what it says, you know, those kind of things, uh, but you know, some, one of, one of the ones, this one we understand on our, our car dashboard, right, you got the, you got the gauges, is the battery hot, is the battery cold, how much fuel do I have, you know, all those kind of things, some of you pay total disregard to the gauge that measures uh, speed, I'm just, uh, been behind you while you drive, and I wasn't behind you very long, uh, as you just, kept right on going, but you, but you understand gauge. It's an instrument or device used to measure, check this out, used to measure magnitude, content, or volume. But used as a verb, it means to estimate, to measure magnitude, content, volume. And so today, I, I want to share with you, over the next two weeks, I want to talk to you about gauges, five gauges uh, that will... Uh, evaluate kind of your spiritual life. Five, five gauges that if you'll pay attention to them and, and make sure they're all running on full uh, as God pours into you and fills you up as you trust him with joy and peace if it's running on full you'll just explode. And so over the next five uh, and over the next two weeks I want to talk to you about uh, five gauges because it's time to gauge your gauge. It is just time to gauge your gauge. Uh, how are you doing spiritually today? Uh, when the next situation comes and confronts you and you don't have the power to face it, will you still overflow with joy? So, so maybe you could say these are five hope gauges. Maybe you want to say they're five trust gauges. Uh, uh, just let me give them to you. I think that's going to be uh, the next. Uh, the, the first one is praise. Well, we'll talk about praise. If there's just praise going on in my life, uh, hope's going to flow out. Uh, friendship. Uh, those are the two we're going to cover today, uh, praise and friendship. 
Uh, but then they're going to talk about gracious speech, prayer, and articulate response. So on your outline, you see one, two, three, four, five on both sides. So blank one is praise. On the back side, we're, uh, the top number two is friendship. Uh, three is gracious speech, prayer, and articulate response. So uh, let's jump into this and engage your gaze. Why do I want to do this? Because I, I'm convinced that if, if these uh, gauges are reading full, if you're paying attention in these five areas, uh, if, you're, if you're gauging the praise in your life and the friendships of your life and your gracious speech and prayer and articulate response, if you're, if you're paying attention to those things and making sure the gauge is reading full, uh, your spiritual life's just going to skyrocket. It's just going to explode. You're going to go places you never thought you would be able to go. And if you don't pay attention, if, if those tanks just get empty, spiritually, you're going to dry up and die. And I think collectively for us as a community of faith, if, if these five areas uh, we're focusing on them and paying attention to them, uh, uh, when we face things that we don't know how to face, this hope's going to come pouring out and our community is going to be changed and, and the world of which we want to reach for Jesus is, is just going to be uh, touched by a, by a word and they're just going to understand how much hope they have. And if we don't pay attention to these things as a community of faith, uh, we're just going to wither up and die. So uh, let's just jump in on praise. Praise. You come to church every week and we give you a chance uh, to sing three, four songs, and, and I watch, and some of you are excited about that, and some of you at that point in the service just pull your uh, mobile phone out and you just start scrolling through it. Um, wh wh why? Wh why? Why do we do that? Why do we give time for praise? Look what the psalmist says about praise and hope. He says, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. He's like, hope in my life. As for me, I always have hope. And part of just the overflow of hope is just praise. I'm just going to praise you more and more. I'm going to praise you more and more. I'm going to praise you more and more. I'm going to praise you more and more. Now, it's very important that we understand what this word means. It's a word we use. Uh, you know uh, a working definition. I don't have to give you a working English definition of praise. You know what praise is. You know what it is to receive praise. You know what it is to give praise. But I want you to look. There are about eight Hebrew words, the Old Testament written uh, originally in Hebrew, about eight Hebrew words that define praise. And the word that's used here, this isn't going to be on the screen, but there's a fill in the blank for you. The word that's used here means to sing loudly. To sing loudly. And so the, the songwriter says, as for me, I will always have hope. I will sing loudly to you more and more. Loudly to you more and more. Loudly to you more and more. Is that the kind of praise that flows out of your mouth, or is the praise that flows out of your mouth the praise? Of, uh, is it, I don't know. But one of the uh, one of the opportunities to, uh, to gauge is the praise. Uh, the word that's used here, uh, the main word for praise is uh, halal. You didn't might not even know it. You you know a Hebrew word, hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. It's a it's a Hebrew word, and it means uh, halal means to praise. Uh, to offer praise, and uh, the Yah at the end of it is Yahweh, the name of God. Hal hallelujah is to praise Yahweh, to praise God. And, but, but this word uh, that's used in the song that I just gave you, Psalm 71, 14, is a derivative. It's to lula, and it means to sing praise to Yahweh, to sing loudly praise to Yahweh. It, it's just singing is vital to the worship of God. Singing is vital to the worship of God. There are over 300 biblical mandates that you and I should sing praise to God. Over 300 times in God's words, it says you and I should sing praise to God. It, it ought to be a part of who we are. Uh, Psalm 145.3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is great as the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The more we dig into who God is, the more we understand uh, how much he loves us and how much he cares about us, how much he showers grace on us, that his love, we cannot earn it and we do not deserve it, but he loves us anyway. The more we understand that he, he forgives our failures and he forgives our faults and he just uh, pours his grace on us anyway. Great is the Lord and, and greatly to be praised, greatly to be praised, greatly to be praised, greatly to be praised. It's this understanding that God commands us uh, to praise him. How's that going in your life? You're like, hey, Tim, it's really hard for me to praise God because of the circumstances that are surrounding me right now. I don't understand how the psalmist says, remember last week we saw that he was an old guy, he was an old guy in trouble. He was an old guy in trouble not just once, but once again, and he still continued to praise God. And so I, I just the circumstances that surround me. I, I want to share with you a little bit of a Hebrew lesson 
uh, but hopefully it makes the point. Uh, this word, halal, it appears in the scriptures in two ways, and it's the exact same word. Once it appears, uh, sometimes it appears and it means to offer praise. Other times it appears and it means to shine like light. And it's different. Uh, my Hebrew professor, uh, when I was working on my master's degree, his name was Dr. Dr. Huey. And Dr. Huey, always, on every Hebrew exam we had, he put the word halal on the test. And he's like, give me a definition. Well, we knew that it could mean one of two things. It either meant to offer praise or to shine like light. And so, first exam, I put that down, as did most every other person, and he counted it incorrect. And I'm like, I know that's the definition. And his response to us was, you don't know without context. You cannot interpret this word by itself without the context. Context is everything, because sometimes it means to offer praise, and sometimes it means to shine like light. Let me show you a couple of examples uh, from Job. Job 29, 3. When his lamp shone on my head, by his light, his halal, I walked through the darkness. All right? That's how Job says it. When, when the planet around me, it was nighttime and it was dark uh, because God shone his light, I, I walked through the darkness. Uh, Job uses it again later in the book. Uh, have I looked at the sun shining, halal, in the skies or the moon walking down its silver pathway? And it's fascinating to me that this word halal can mean to offer praise or it can honestly, it can mean to shine like light, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Because regardless of the circumstances of life, the only thing you need to do is look up. But some of you are walking around like this, bent over, like that lady in Luke chapter 13, and the only thing you see is dirt and filth and earth around you, and you've, you've lost the ability uh, for whatever reason, to look up. Can you imagine this lady 18 years uh, walking around like this and everybody's looking at her and all she sees is dirt and filth and the earth. Uh, she has not the ability, I think maybe she lost her vision for what life was supposed to look like. I think maybe she lost a sense of the future because she was bent over. And some of you uh, ha have just spiritually become bent over and you've forgotten to look up. And I think God wants us to understand this concept of praise. Uh, it's a light that shines. Uh, one of our students, a college student this week, uh, posted on his uh, social media picture. I don't know if any of you saw it, a, a picture of the sun. He's like, hey, y'all, I'm, I'm baffled. The sun has a rainbow around it. And I don't know what's going to, it was beautiful. And, and I tried to take a picture of it, and the pictures don't do it justice. And and I just couldn't help as, you know, sometimes the pastor in you comes out, you know, just kind of flows out. And I'm like, I love the word baffle. And I think it's time some of us get baffled by the sun again. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his majesty. Day after day, the sun runs its course. The moon takes its place. They use no words, but they speak volumes. While we were on vacation, a uh, a few weeks ago, I had, uh, we had several amazing days, but I had one of the most amazing days I've ever had in my life because I, I got to witness three things in one 24-hour period of time. And again, the pictures don't do it justice. Uh, here's the first one. Um, from my spot, I got to watch the sunrise over the ocean, and it was spectacular. And I loved every minute of it, just to watch the, there in the privacy, none of my family was up yet, because nobody gets up as early as I do at my house. But uh, I, I just watch and just the, the man, I just watch the sunrise and there's something spectacular about it. It, it kind of leaves you speechless. Uh, later that night, we, we took a drive and we went and we, we watched this. We watched the sunset on the ocean. And again, just spectacular. And you think uh, it rises in the east and it sets in the west. Oh, how, how beautiful of a day to get to watch the sunrise and the sunset. And it just ran its course and that's God. But that night, I got to see something I had never witnessed in my life. I got to watch the moon rise. Here's a picture. Um, 
And I, we're, we're sitting out just enjoying the, the ocean view, and it was dark, and all of a sudden, here comes, oh, watch that. So I ran back in to get my phone, and so the moon's already this high up before, you know, I can, can capture it. But I literally got to watch the moon come, just like the sun, right over the ocean, and it was spectacular. And it left me breathless, and I think it's why Job says, have I looked at the sun in the skies or the moon walking down its silver pathway? And the only response can be praise regardless of the circumstances, regardless of this. All, it takes us back to the first day of creation when the creator said, let there be light. And he separated the darkness from the light. And the way we walk out of the physical darkness is the same way we walk out of the spiritual darkness when his light shines. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And when his light shines us, in us, things sing. It's why the songwriter says this in Psalm, uh, next, I think it's the next verse popping up. Uh, Psalm 34, I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. I will constantly speak of his glories and grace. Because all I have to do is just look up. No matter what the other circumstances are, no matter how hard it gets, no matter what people say against me, no matter how difficult the situation, no matter how high the mountain, no matter how tough the digging, no matter how, pl- how hard the, the treading, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just praise him no matter what happens. Is that where you're at in your life today? And I think about just some of the things that have happened in the life of our church just in the last week. Uh, death has impacted families in our church. Uh, cancer has reared its ugly head uh, in uh, multiple families across the life of our church. Sickness and health and rebellion and all the things that are going on. And I, I just want to know, is this me? I'll praise the Lord no matter uh, what happens. I'll speak of his glories and grace. Next verse. Uh, the songwriter again says, I will exalt you, my God, my King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Check this out. Every day. Would you circle that, highlight that on your teaching outline or in your Bible if you're following along. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. The first gauge to check. Do you praise God every day? You take 15, 20, 30 seconds. Five minutes, whatever it is, just to simply say, okay, God, regardless of the circumstances uh, today, I'm just going to look no further than the sun that's in the sky or the moon that rose tonight walking down that silvery pathway, and I'm just going to praise you because you did that. And you did that, and you're going to shine light on my darkness, and you're going to enable me to walk out. God, I just, I'm just going to praise you regardless of the circumstances every single day. Uh, the first gauge, the first question to ask is, do I praise God every day? Do I praise God every day? On your teaching outline, uh, I put... Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Would you make it a goal this week to just say, I'm going to praise God every day? And guess what? Uh, You get a built-in opportunity to do it today. We're going to force your hand. We're just going to give, every time you walk in, every Sunday um, you walk in, we're going to give you the chance to do this. Uh, Why do we do it? Friends, um, like it or not, Sunday morning, worship time, Praise, musical worship time, praise time is dress rehearsal for heaven. If you don't like to praise God now, you're going to hate heaven. Let me say that again. If you don't like to praise God now, you're going to hate heaven. And and, and you're not going to get by in heaven with your mobile device while the praise is going on. It's not going to happen. This is dress rehearsal for heaven. When you are gathered together with other people, I, I grow very weary. Please forgive me. As a pastor, I have a few pet peeves. I, I grow very weary of hearing people say, oh, I don't have to uh, worship on Sunday. I get my praise on in my truck. That is so disrespectful to God. I, I understand that you're going to praise God privately, but the opportunity to praise God with God's people is what heaven's going to be about. Just listen, just listen, just listen to the word of God. After this, I heard what sounded like a roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He's condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He's avenged her on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! And the smoke goes uh, up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried out, Amen! Hallelujah! Do you hear the word? Hallelujah! 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 And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all of you his servants who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder, shouting, here it comes again, hallelujah for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his 
bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added these words, these are the true words of God. Hallelujah. That's the picture of what happens around God's throne in heaven where we're singing. And the best the author can come up with was, it sounded like a clap of thunder and a roar of water. That's what it sounded like. Because God's people are around his throne. Everyone participates, no bystanders. The sound is deafening. And it's the chief occupation of God's people in heaven to just praise God. And you get a chance every week to do that here. And now, team, you want to come up? Uh, we're going to give you that chance. And I don't know how you come into Sundays viewing our worship time of, hey, it's just preparation so we can get to the teaching. Hey, it's just, you know, whatever. It's just what we do. Uh, by the way, I didn't do this. As the team's coming up, come on up. That's great. Um, you can start moving stuff too. I'll hold this off so you can move this. Um, uh, how do I know if I'm singing loudly enough? Here, here's what is implied in the definition of the Hebrew word. You know you're singing loudly enough when it appears as nonsense to the non-worshipper. That's what the word means. When it appears as nonsense to the non-Christian, when it appears as nonsense to the non-worshipper, why are those? They're crazy. What are they doing? But here's the deal. I believe with all of my heart that though it appears to, as nonsense to the non-worshipper, they're captivated by it because they're like, that's real to those people. This is a moment that something real is happening. I want to know more about that. So I don't know where you're at here on your spiritual journey. I, I have no clue. But we're going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes. I don't know how long this is going to last. We're just going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes praising God, worshiping Him, preparing for heaven. What a great opportunity we have to do this together. Would you stand with me as we praise our Lord? Hey, good morning. Well, are you guys ready for dress rehearsal? All right. I love that definition of the word praise uh, to sing loudly. So that's how we're going to start it off. You guys say it with me. I will sing loudly to you more and more. Ready? I will sing loudly to you more and more. Again, I will sing loudly to you one more time with a little energy. I will sing loudly to you.
us to praise your holy name, the God of the universe, the God who created us all, the God who rises the sun and rises the moon and makes all the stars and keeps it all together every evening, Lord, and we just take that for granted, and there's a lot of things in our lives that we take for granted, God, but we just thank you for them all, and we just ask, Lord, that you would continue to give us um, open hearts and open minds and that you would help us to grow more and more like you each and every single day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, if that's dress rehearsal, I can't wait, man. I am so excited about uh, the chance. Uh, by, by the way, you're, you're there, and, and there's this uh, age-old struggle uh, in churches um, that's like, well, I just don't like the music. I don't know the words. Um, that's not a Crowder song. That's, that's not a Hillsong song. That's not a, if I had my way, we would do nothing but hymns out of a hymn book and sing Southern gospel music. That's all, we, that's all we would do. But it's not about me. Worship is never about me. Sunday mornings is never about me. Sunday mornings is about God. And Sunday mornings is about those who don't know Jesus yet. And so I put my personal preferences aside. And I simply say, I'm going to get together with God's people, and I can't do that anyplace else on the planet in a room with God's people just simply lifting praise to his name. I can't do that in my car. I can't do that at my house. I just can't do it like this. This is just dress rehearsal for heaven, and it's just this amazing moment. And so gauge number one is uh, uh, how, how, how am I praising? Do I praise God every day? By the way, I had a, a, college, a high school coach. Uh, how, how many of you know the phrase, uh, practice makes? I had a high school coach who said, uh, I can't say what he said about that statement exactly, but he said, uh, that, let me say, he said, that's not true. He said, practice doesn't make perfect. A practice makes permanent. If you practice a skill incorrectly, you're going to go to the game and not do it perfectly. You'll do it incorrectly. If we practice worship incorrectly Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and don't sing loudly to God, uh, we're gonna have, uh, the learning curve in heaven is going <laughs> to be huge. And this is just an opportunity to practice uh, what we're going to be doing in heaven. Uh, practice makes permanent, and I want to practice correctly. Uh, by the way, uh, good news for people like me who cannot carry a tune. Um, <laughs> did you hear that laughter that came from our, from our lead worshiper today? Um, I'll, I'll share, so I'll, I hadn't planned on sharing, I'll share this with you. Um, God's word just simply says, make a joyful noise. And I'm glad his definition of joyful noise is this big and not that. Um, I, I don't hear music. Uh, I can't clap on beat. I am always on the off beat, and I cannot carry a tune. So you're in the room, and I'm not going to sing loudly because I can't carry a tune. Well, if I sing loudly, you can sing loudly because here's the deal. If, if I forget to turn off my microphone, my microphone, uh, the guys upstairs, they mute it in the house speakers, but it is not muted in the monitors of the people on the stage. And so if ever there's a Sunday and you see them all look at me like this with a glare, uh, they're hearing my offbeat, uh, loud, uh, not on tune voice coming through, and I'm oh, I got to turn that off. And so, if I can do that, and they hear me, and you can sing loudly, uh, because it's just how we're supposed to do. And so, just very simply, how are you going to praise God? Uh, you did it today. How are you going to do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Are uh, you struggling with that? Uh, just listen. Hebrews 13. Through Jesus. Therefore. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Through Jesus. Hey, I look at the sun, look at the moon. But if you're struggling any time else, just look at the cross. Through Jesus. Let us confess his name. It's powerful. But that passage of scripture goes on and says this. Uh, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. Uh, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. I'm amazed when I read the scriptures, this lady who has been over for 18 years, and with a, with a word, with a touch, Jesus said, uh, your infirmity is gone, and, said, and she straightened up, and she praised God. I'm amazed how many times uh, when Jesus heals somebody or does a miracle in somebody's life, um, their response is, hey, Jesus, can we hang out with you? Can we go with you where you and your disciples are going? And the majority of times, Jesus' answer is no. Jesus' answer is no. Jesus says no. I want you to go back and tell your friends and your family what I just did for you. 
Go back and tell the people that you're closest to how, how I've just made a difference in your life. Go back. You see, the, the spirit, the power of Jesus comes uh, to live inside of us and doesn't empower us to, to sit. It empowers us to go, to go to those who need to hear. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for such as the sacrifices, uh, with, with such sacrifices God is pleased. Uh, Romans 10, 15 says it this way. Uh, just what he says, uh, uh, how can they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can they... Uh, preach unless someone sends them. And if people go, it says this, then you'll see a sight to take your breath away. Romans 10, 15. Grand processions of people telling all the good things of God. Just living their life in praise, living their life in praise. And it's going to make a difference. Uh, so gauge one, uh, do I praise God every day? Find some time to do it this week. And come back next week to worship with a group of people. And I get that there's sometimes you can't be here, but that's why we do our stream online, just so you can have a chance to Worship, and it might feel kind of weird, you know, singing at the top of your lungs at home when nobody else is around, but you're gathered with God's people, whether you're gathered with us in the room or gathered with us, you know, across uh, electronic things. But uh, so, gauge one, praise. Gauge two, friendship. Uh, friendship. But it's a little different kind of friendship. I look at the scriptures consistently and look at the Jesus stories. Notice that Jesus had a, had a heart for those who were far away from God. On one occasion, Jesus is walking around the Sea of Galilee. He's on the northern side towards Capernaum, and he, he comes across this, uh, this tax collector. Uh, some people call him Matthew. Some people call him Levi. And Jesus kind of walks by his tax collector's booth and just looks at him and says, you follow me. Matthew drops everything, and he, he follows Jesus. And, and that night... Uh, Matthew, because he's leaving the tax collector business, uh, throws himself a party with all the other tax collectors in town. Now, tax collectors, you need to understand, uh, weren't very well liked. Uh, you say, well, they just collected taxes for Rome. Yes, but they collected taxes, collected taxes from Rome, but they were your fellow Jewish citizens, and they were getting rich on your taxes, and, and you couldn't feed your family because of the taxes they were collecting, and there was hatred among tax collectors, and they were considered some of the, some of the outcasts of society and so uh, Jesus is hanging out with a bunch of tax collectors at this party that Matthew throws at his house before he's going to spend time uh, going away with Jesus and, and, and just listen. And, and, and the Pharisees, the religious people of the day, they have trouble with it and they, and they ask a question and, and it's not directed to Jesus, it's directed to Jesus' followers and they, they say, uh, why, why, does your, why does your master, why, why does your Lord, why does he hang out with uh, uh, tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard what they were saying, and, and Jesus' response was, I, I just need to ask you a question. Uh, when it comes to life, who needs a doctor? Those who are healthy or, or, or the sick? And the implication is, it's the sick. It's the sick who need a doctor to, to heal them. And, and so uh, they were appalled that Jesus would spend time with tax collectors and sinners. In fact, uh, Jesus had a nickname. And it wasn't one that most people would be proud of. His nickname was Friend of Sinners. His nickname was Friend of Sinners. What's, what's the next verse on the screen? Uh, yeah, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was a, was a friend of sinners. Uh, Jesus spent time. Uh, he, he's going through town one day, and there's a parade, and there's a guy, Zacchaeus, wants to see Jesus, and he can't get to Jesus, and he just wants to see him. He doesn't necessarily even have to have a conversation with him, and he climbs up into this tree, and as Jesus comes by, he, he, just, he just stops, and he looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree, because I'm going to have dinner at your house today. And the people were appalled. The religious people were appalled that Jesus would go into the house of a sinner, he was supposed to be holy. He was supposed to be pure. He was supposed to be set apart. But when the Spirit of God rests on you and the power of God is inside of you, it does not enable you to sit. It enables you and empowers you to go. And Jesus was consistently a going. The Scriptures say about Jesus, he, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Those people that were far from God and Jesus consistently and regularly spent time with them and he got with them around their table. Our, our youngest daughter spent... Um, a little over six, right about six months uh, over in uh, Africa uh, serving uh, just this last uh, year. 
And we talked to her about her experiences, and she said one of her favorite things was when they uh, sat down to eat a weekly, the weekly meal together, they, they shared a common bowl. And she started explaining to me what the common bowl was. It was literally a common bowl. And they had fish and rice and all of the things in. And if you wanted to reach, you reached in with your hand and you ate. And then you reached in with your hand again. And you were probably going to touch the hand of the person that was next to you. It was a common bowl. And this is how they ate in Jesus' day. Uh, there was common food. And to eat with sinners it simply meant you, eat, you ate with them. You didn't have your knife and your fork and your plate and your, you know, your private space. You, you were touching. And, and he's going to eat with sinners and he's going to touch people that are dirty. He's going to touch people that are far away from God. That's going to make him unclean. Do you see the picture? And so it was a derogatory nickname. Jesus is a, is a friend of sinners. And the accusation was true. But it's a dialogue of grace. How, how am I going to be? So, so um, here, here's what happens. The longer we're followers of Jesus, left to our own devices, we're going to have fewer and fewer people around us that are far away from him because we just tend to surround ourselves. And we need Christian fellowship and we need people who are like-minded. But Jesus is very intentional. He said, I, I need you to go. I've healed you so that you can go. As the Father sent me, so send I you. How, how can they hear unless someone is sent and, and we're sent? And, and this lady uh, stands up and she praises God and she goes and tells. And just look at the stories of Jesus' healing in the scriptures and consistently the people, Jesus, can I hang out with you? He's like, no, go and tell somebody the story of Jesus. And so time to gauge your gauge. Is, is hope going to come pouring out of me as I, as I trust Jesus, as I, as, as I spend time, as he pours joy and peace, he gives me eyes that see that, that passage in Luke 13. Uh, Jesus is in the, in the synagogue and he's preaching and it says he saw the woman. And when Jesus saw people who were far away from him, the scriptures say it tore him up on the inside. It, it wrenched his guts on the inside to see that these people that God had created that he loved were far away from God. And, and he uses an interesting term. He says he, he, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And you get the picture, even though we don't live in that environment, uh, sheep without a shepherd are helpless, you know, at least the turtle has its shell. And, and the porcupine ha has its uh, quills. And the gazelle can run. And the sheep can say, bah, and become lunch. You know, that's, that's about it. A sheep needs a shepherd. And Jesus saw these people who are far with their sheep without a shepherd and they are vulnerable and they are hurting and they need somebody to share with them the love and the grace of God and that's why he came and that's why he sends us. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, so send I you to be friends of sinners. So question, here's time to gauge your gauge. Here's the question of friendship. Who is at your table? Who's at your table? Who are you that intimately acquainted with, that you're rubbing shoulders with, that you're spending time with, that doesn't know Jesus? Who's at your table, uh, your, your literal table? How long has it been since you've uh, talked to uh, your neighbor who is a self-proclaimed atheist and, and just said, hey, come over for dinner? And, I, and who's at your table? Who's at your table if we're not careful? Who's at your table? Here's what the scripture says talking about what Jesus did. It says, all of this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all human beings his friends through Christ. God did not keep account of their sins as he is, and he has given us this message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. And it's not going to happen unless we are intentional. When God heals us, we go. We don't just feel like we've got to hang out with Jesus more and more, and then we'll be ready to go. No, when he heals us, he's like, I want you to stand up, and I want you to praise me, and I want you to go to those who desperately need to hear. Here's the problem. Um, we've forgotten how to read the gauge. And we read the gauge incorrectly. This uh, from a dashboard of a car, and I don't know how well you can see it, but over here is the fuel gauge, and at the top is an F, and at the bottom is an E. Without saying, 
uh, just by show of hands, how many of you know what the F and the E stand for? Can I see your hands? Please, not a trick question. How many of you know? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, in uh, driver's ed class. And that was the question. The professor just did that. How many of you know what the F and the E stand for? Everybody in the class raises their hand. And he calls on a kid in our class uh, just randomly and says, okay, uh, tell me what it stands for. Not joking, not trying to be sarcastic, not trying to be funny. This boy, this 15-year-old boy in our driver's ed class says, I know what they stand for, yes. Um, F is finished, E is enough. <laughs> True story. F is finished, E is enough. He didn't know how to read the gauge. Band, if you want to come up, that would be great. Here's the problem. When it comes to your relationship with God, some of you don't know how to read the gauge. It's pretty simple, and it's pretty straightforward. But you believe your relationship with God is built on you being good enough. If you just do enough right things, if you just are the kindest person and the caring person, and you meet people's needs, that if you just do enough good things, that God's going to love you, and your eternity will be spent in heaven uh, praising God. That's not how the gauge is read. The gauge reads this way, there's one way and one way only into heaven. And the only entrance into heaven is through Jesus Christ. Uh, the gauge tells us very simply, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You see, God had a plan. And God's plan was that he would create you and that he would spend eternity with you and that you would spend eternity uh, praising him because he wants, desperately wants a relationship with you. And God did not create you out of his emptiness, out of his loneliness, out of his boredom. God created you out of his fullness so that you could know life and know it abundantly. And God wants this relationship uh, with you. It's why he created the universe. He didn't create the universe simply for the stars. He didn't create them for the heavens, for the moon, for the sun. He created it for you so that you could have a relationship with the living God. And he loves you so desperately. The scriptures say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. The verse right after that says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God has a plan for you and a plan for me. And if we're rating the gauge any other way, we've got a problem. And the scriptures say we have a problem. God had a plan, we had a problem. The problem is very simply this, it's called sin. God's word said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The scriptures say the wages of sin is death. The scriptures say that when we determine what sin is, by a biblical definition, sin is anything we say that doesn't please God. Sin is anything we think that doesn't please God. Sin is anything that we do that doesn't please God. Sin is anything that we should have done which would have pleased God, but we left it undone. And by that definition, we can simply say, I've got to agree with the scriptures that if that's the God's definition, and based on the authority of God's word, we believe that's God's definition. If that's the definition of sin, I indeed am a sinner. And I've got a problem. I am separated from eternal God. I'm separated from a holy God. I don't deserve to stand in his presence and praise his name because he can accept sin into his presence. And I cannot earn it and I do not deserve it. So God had a plan. And his plan was Jesus from the beginning. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. The Bible says that God demonstrated his love for you in this, that while you were still a sinner, Christ Jesus died for you. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness because of what Jesus did on the cross. You and I have a problem and we need a substitute to take our place. And Jesus came to take our place on the cross. And he, he lived a life of perfection and he died a death and three days later he rose from the dead to solve our problem. God had a plan. God had a plan to spend eternity with you. We have a problem called sin. God made provision. His name was Jesus. But now it, it comes to you to make a response. And if you're reading the gauge incorrectly, as silly as that sounds, and you think your goodness is going to get you into heaven, it won't. Your spiritual gauge is empty and you'll spend eternity separated from God. The only way you become a friend of God is by trusting what Jesus did for you on the cross. End of discussion. The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. To those who receive him. To those who accept what Jesus did on the cross. To those who accept uh, what he came to do. He didn't come except 
to seek and to save the lost. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so that you and I can spend eternity with God in heaven. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Life here now, more and better life than you ever dreamed of here and life eternal with God. Friends, I just want to know, how have you been reading the gauge? The friend in my driver's ed class had to understand he was reading the gauge wrong. And I got a hunch it would have only taken him one time to run out of gas. And I don't want to be the one time in your spiritual life after death and you're standing in front of the holy God and he says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? Well, I never knew how to read the gauge. I thought I was good enough. And he's simply going to say, no, 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 no. Your goodness to me is nothing but filthy rags. The only thing that gets you into my heaven is what you chose to do with Jesus while you had breath. Friends, what have you chosen to do with Jesus? Praise makes no sense to you. It seems and appears to you as nonsense. These ludicrous people, we didn't even get to talk about raising hands or any of that kind of stuff. These people who just sing loudly at the top of their lungs week in and week out, that makes no sense to me. And it's first and foremost because the gauge of your spiritual life is empty. And you need to say yes to Jesus. And I want to give you the opportunity to do that. But while I'm doing that, Christian, who's at your table? Who's at your table? Who are you rubbing shoulders with that doesn't know Jesus? That the rest of the world considers as an outcast, that the rest of the world considers as marginalized. The rest of the world wants nothing to do with that Jesus died for them. And when you look at them in the face, the only thing you ought to see, you ought to see them like Jesus sees them, and you ought to say, yeah, me too, I need a Savior too. Christian, who's at your table? Friend, if you're here today, you're watching the line, and you don't know Jesus, I want to give you that chance now. All the eyes are bowed, all the hearts are open. Father, I just come in front of you right now and I thank you. But as we praise you, we praise you because of what Jesus did on the cross. We praise you that he lived a life of perfection so that he could be the acceptable sacrifice. We praise you that he, that he went to the cross and was obedient unto death, even death on the cross, and that he rose from the dead. And you've given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and tongue confess and give him praise. But Father, right now, in this moment, some who are listening, they've just been misreading the gauge. And they thought they were okay spiritually because they're a good person, because they're doing good works, because they're doing good deeds. And God, uh, that doesn't fill up the spiritual gauge. God, there's someone listening right now that's never said, God, I believe you had a plan to spend eternity with me. God, I admit that I have a problem. I'm a sinner. But God, today I, I accept the good news that while I was still a sinner, Jesus died for me. God, today I confess my sin. I, I make a response. I confess my sin. I ask Jesus to come into my life to be my, my Lord and Savior. God, I want to follow him. God, I want to spend my, my days in praise. But God, I know it starts. Um, today I, I read the gauge correctly and say I deserve death, but I accept the life that Jesus has. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Friend, if you just, there's nothing magical about those words, but if you've never asked Jesus, and your spiritual gauge, your eternal gauge is on empty today. The only way it's filled up is by asking Jesus. I want to give you one more chance. Maybe you say this prayer, God, today, I don't understand it all, but I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Save me. Fill me. In the room, all the eyes are bowed. Uh, still closed. If you prayed that prayer this morning with me or a prayer like it, could I just see your hand somewhere in the room? Could you just lift it up quickly? And thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you very much. Here's what the scripture says. The scripture says that if you, that if you call on the uh, name of the Lord, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The scriptures say that there's a party going on in heaven right now because you asked Jesus to be your Savior. Father, I thank you for those moments, for those people that said yes to Jesus. Father, forgive their sins as you already have. May they understand that as they've called on you, salvation is theirs right here, right now. God, we thank you for that. Uh, all eyes open, all hearts still open. Uh, there have been people who today have uh, had a spiritual gauge that's changed from empty to full because they asked Jesus to be their Savior. Would you just applaud that decision? Um, we are...